our guest today is uh, Prashanto Kochavara, um, who is going to talk about Trilio Vault for Kubernetes. And Trilio is a new OpenShift Commons member. And the way this whole works is uh, Prashanto is going to talk and give a presentation. He's going to do a bit of a demo as well. Um, and then we'll have live Q&A um, at the end of this. So um, without any further ado, Prashanto, please um, introduce yourself. Tell us all about what Trilio is doing um, and what you're doing um, with Trilio Vault. Great. Thank you, Diane. Uh, firstly, uh, very excited to be here at the OpenShift Commons briefing. My name is uh, Prashant Kochabara. I'm the Director of Product for Kubernetes at Trilio. And today I'm going to be presenting Trilio Vault for Kubernetes. I'm going to be talking about uh, the product, the architecture, functionality, use cases, compatibility, and be following up with a recorded demo to give you guys an idea as to how the product works. So the agenda for today is I'm going to talk a bit about the company, Trilio, uh, who we are and what we have been doing. Uh, and then we'll dive into the customer problem, you know, talking about legacy data protection solutions versus cloud native data protection solutions and why one is needed more today. Uh, next, we will give an overview of the product that we have built, which is Trilio Wall for Kubernetes, and then we'll follow up with the technical details of the product. Then uh, after that, we will dive into the demo to kind of put uh, the rubber to the road to see how everything works. And then finally, I will be providing a summary of whatever we learned on this session. So uh, jumping right in into the company overview, who we are. So Trilio was founded in uh, 2013. We are the leading data protection solution for uh, OpenStack and Rev environments. We have uh, enterprise customers uh, located all over the globe, uh, along with our offices as well. Uh, we are backed by uh, leading tech luminaries and venture capitalists. Uh, we have been in the business for the past seven years, so we have been doing data protection for a while. So we have come up with a lot of different innovative technologies that we have patented as well. And then from a partner ecosystem, we, have, we are uh, Red Hat and IBM partner. We've been pa partners for a very long time and have been doing business also for a very long time. And uh, as mentioned over here on the slide, we had a Red Hat certified partner as well. And uh, from a platform perspective, we have products to do data protection of OpenStack, as I mentioned. We have products to do data protection of Red Hat virtualization. And now we are pivoting to address the data protection needs of a cloud native environment. Now let's talk about the customer challenge. And to do that, I'm going to uh, illustrate via applications and how they have evolved over time. So back in the day, we had bare metal servers with uh, one operating system and applications running on those operating systems. These applications were tightly integrated. When I say tightly integrated, that means like all the components of that application were running within the same domain, there were dependencies of the components on each other, and that's why it was difficult to decouple or run them without the boundaries of a operating system. And the operating system itself provided a lot of base layers that were needed and which were taken for granted by the application. Then we moved into the virtualization world. Uh, when we moved into virtualization, we did not change the architecture of an application. Applications still work the same way, were tightly integrated, you know, all, uh, all the components were tightly integrated running within the operating system boundary. But what changed was the efficiency of the underlying hardware. So virtualization uh, did not change the architecture, it brought in efficiency of the overall resources within your data center. Now, when we get into a cloud native world, what we see is that an application is broken down into multiple microservices, right? All these microservices are independent components that run uh, within an environment which have their own identity. And in order to protect an application, all these individual components need to be protected together. They need to be backed up, not only the uh, not only the data portion of it, but also the metadata portion of it. So as a result, the architecture has changed and that's why a different kind of a solution is needed to protect a cloud native application. Let's look at uh, why traditional data protection solution cannot uh, match up to the needs or the requirements of cloud native applications. 
So firstly, uh, traditional data protection solutions and cloud native applications, they are disparate technologies. Uh, you need a cloud native application to provide data protection for cloud native uh, uh, applications running in your environment. For example, you cannot have, or it would be really uh, costly to run a VM based uh, data protection technology to be protecting a complete cloud native environment. So you would have to have a virtualization or VMs running uh, to protect your cloud native and it wouldn't be a right fit. With traditional data protection technologies, you also have an application OS dependence that we spoke about. They're siloed, they are focused on monolithic applications. These applications do change footprint, but it is very rare. Uh, they are generally focused on the storage or the data volumes, and they do not focus on the metadata layout, the topologies, and so on. And from a role perspective or a persona perspective, these traditional solutions are focused more towards uh, you know, infrastructure admins versus uh, developers or DevOps admins. And when we look at the cloud native applications, uh, as we mentioned, they are modular microservices oriented. Each has its own identity. They're highly available. They are highly scalable. They change their footprint uh, on demand. They are built with new languages and frameworks. They're highly automated and API driven. If we think about all those individual components and if we had to manage them, you know, uh, individually, it would be uh, a, a management nightmare. So that's why there is a lot of automation and policy-driven uh, uh, policy uh, ideas that are managing a cloud-native landscape. Now let's talk about uh, Trillio Vault for Kubernetes. But before doing that, I'm going to talk about uh, Trillio Vault DNA, or what Trillio provides in all of its uh, data protection solutions. So first, uh, we believe in building our product as an agentless product. We do not uh, insert any agent within uh, a virtual machine if you're protecting a virtual machine via OpenStack products, or we do not have any sidecars to uh, protect your pods and your workloads in an OpenShift or a Kubernetes environment. Uh, we are completely multi-cluster or uh, multi-tenant. Uh, we adhere to the principles of our back of whatever platform we work with. Uh, we believe in the concept of self-service UI integration. So wherever we have an integration point with a uh, Kubernetes distribution, we integrate into that as well. And we believe in the theory of uh, being completely scalable, linear, and tending to infinite scale as well. Uh, we are non-disruptive, so there is no disruption of your existing workflows or existing applications when you uh, install Trillio Vault or when you operate Trillio Vault in your environment. And then uh, we follow an open universal backup schema. What this open universal backup schema does is not only it uh, avoids vendor lock-in, but you are free to use your data after it's backed up to do additional workflows. And the open universal backup schema that we use, I'll be talking more about it uh, in further slides, uh, provides a lot of uh, data efficiency features as well. So you, uh, you are able to eliminate a, a hardware deduplication appliance because of the innovative style of how data is copied into the target because of the underlying format. Uh, apart from that, there are additional features around uh, granular file system recovery that can be achieved with this open universal backup schema as well. Now, let's talk about Trillio World for Kubernetes and the key attributes of this product. So going uh, clockwise, firstly, we are application centric. So we focus on the application layer. Uh, we protect not only the data volume, but also the metadata of all the Kubernetes objects that an application comprises of. We are native to Kubernetes and OpenShift. So we are built uh, on the uh, Kube API server. So you do not need any other CLI or API to manage the uh, Kubernetes uh, environment or the Trillio Vault environment within Kubernetes. Uh, we are deployed as uh, custom resource definitions that you can use to manage the overall product. Now from an application deployment and ecosystem tooling perspective, uh, what Trillio Vault can protect are your applications, whether they are deployed via Helm, 
whether they are deployed via operators or whether they are deployed by labels or just have uh, you know, custom label tags to it. We also integrate into Prometheus for monitoring. We have dashboards available in Grafana and our logs are integrated into FluentD as well. Uh, jumping on to the left side, infrastructure compatibility. Uh, we leverage the CSI mechanism to talk to storage. So as long as the storage uh, has a CSI driver uh, available, we will be uh, automatically uh, supporting that storage platform. Uh, from a target location as to where your backups are going to be stored, we support NFS and S3 as the underlying protocol. Uh, S3 can be on-prem S3-based storage or can even be Amazon S3 as the target. And uh, more importantly, we are a certified technology. We are certified. Uh, we are a certified operator within OpenShift. We have Cloud Pack for Data and MCM or Multi Cloud Management as well. Now, all this, uh, we want to make it easy for our customers to, you know, uh, understand the product, test drive it, and then work it in their environment as well. So what we've done is we have provided live environments directly through our website that you can come and play with uh, Trillium Wall for Kubernetes. And also from a licensing perspective, we have free and basic license available. Uh, the free license gives you unlimited number of nodes for uh, 30 days. The basic license gives you uh, up to 10 nodes uh, with an unlimited time period. And then you also have the enterprise license with premium support, which uh, is the full plethora of the innovation and features that Trillium World for Kubernetes provides. So I spoke about uh, Trillium World for Kubernetes being uh, that had uh, operator certified. So we are found directly within Operator Hub. So if you go into Operator Hub today and you search for Trillio, we will be listed as an application or an operator-based application that you can install within your OpenShift environment. And after you install, this is how we would look. Uh, as part of the demo, we would be touching a bit more upon the cosmetic of the product. Next, I'm going to talk about the packaging and accessibility. So we have uh, we have packaged our product as an operator-based application. So when, within an upstream environment, you can use Helm version 2 or version 3 to deploy the Trillio Vault uh, operator. And then we have a single CRD that will be used to basically deploy the application and use the application after that. Um, on the OpenShift side, what we've done is we have an OLM-based operator as well. Uh, on a UBI image. And uh, what this operator does is it deploys all the CRDs to manage the product. And we are directly embedded within Operator Hub, as I already mentioned, and we will be available in operatorhub.io as well. Next, I'm going to quickly talk about the overall architecture of the product and how Trillio Vault for uh, Kubernetes has been constructed. So at the very first layer, it is the user interaction. This is where the user creates uh, his custom resources for backup plans, targets, backups, and restores. Uh, within the next layer, which is the control plane layer, we have the controllers for, for all our uh, custom resource definitions, which monitor the custom resource definitions. And if there are any changes to them, they make or apply those changes within the Cube API server. And what the control plane does is that it helps to capture the metadata from the application and it transfers that metadata into the target location, which could be a NFS or an S3 repository as mentioned. And then finally, we have the data plane. Within the data plane is where the actual uh, copy transfer happens of the persistent volumes. We do uh, full backups, we do incremental backups, and we, as I mentioned, we keep it as an open uh, format, which is QCOW2 format on the backup target as well. Next, I'm gonna talk about uh, our custom resource definitions and how the product or how the user operations generally flow. So first one is the target. So as mentioned, uh, the user would first create a target, which would be a S3 or an NFS-based uh, storage location where the backups would be placed. 
Uh, after that, you have the policy. A policy can be a scheduling policy or a retention policy, which says how often to take the backup and how uh, how many backups to keep as per your compliance needs. And then we also have the concept of hooks. So if you have uh, stateful uh, workloads like databases, you can uh, QS the database and unQS it by using the pre and post hooks. Now, all these three uh, custom resources are referenced within the backup plan. Backup plan is the overall definition of what you're backing up, where you're backing it up to, how often you're backing it up, and if there are any intricate injections that are needed as part of the application or uh, multiple applications that you're backing up. Uh, the thing to note over here is, you know, the backup plan can be a single Helm app, can be a single operator app, can be a single label based app, or can be multiple Helm, multiple label, multiple operators, or can be a combination of Helm, label, or operators. So depending upon whatever you want to pro uh, protect, it could be one Helm application talking to another Helm application, which is talking to an operator based application. You can define all of that within the backup plan. So if you were to back up your namespaces completely, you can create a backup plan which defines all the applications within it, and it would be able to back up all of that together for you. The next custom resource that we have is the backup custom resource in which you provide uh, whether your backup should be a full backup or an incremental backup. And obviously, if it's a uh, schedule based uh, policy, then it would be using that schedule to take that backup periodically as well. And once you've taken your backup, the next operation to do would be to restore. Now, your restores can happen based on the name of the backup, which would be if you're within the same cluster or same namespace, or you can restore by location. If you are migrating between uh, clusters, you would point to the location where you want to pick the backup from. And once you apply the restore custom resource definition, you will get your application back, whether it's a Helm label operator or a combination of uh, all, of, all of those. Next, I'm going to talk about the protection and recovery. Um, so as mentioned, we protect the metadata of the application as well as the persistent volumes. Uh, and we do that for Helm operators and labels. So what happens is now you can back up your application from one namespace into another namespace within the same cluster, or you can back up your application from one cluster to another cluster in a completely different namespace. So not only does it uh, enables pure data protection within your uh, standalone cluster, but it also enables uh, use cases like disaster recovery and migration if you're going to subsequent clusters or uh, other clusters than your source cluster. Now let's talk about what does uh, Trillia World for Kubernetes backup. So as mentioned, we backup labels uh, if your applications just have, you know, if they're custom applications with just a label tag on them, we will, we can back that up. If your applications are based on Helm, we can back your Helm applications up. Or if they are operator based applications, we can do that as well. When we do the label based backup, what we do is we look at the spec of all the resources and we back up the spec portion of it and all the resources that the application comprises of. So whether it is the pods, PVs, config maps, secrets, we uh, capture all of that. Every PV that we find, uh, we capture the data out of the PV and store it within our target location at, as a QCOW2 format as well. On the Helm side of it, uh, we back up all revisions of your application, including the deployed revision of the release. Uh, then we parse the chart, we identify which are the persistent volumes, and we back up those persistent volumes as well. The key point to remember here is that when we back up and restore a Helm-based application using Trillio World for Kubernetes, we maintain the application uh, type. So for example, a Helm application, when restored, is still a Helm application. You can still use your Helm upgrades, your Helm rollback commands, to manage that application after it has been restored. Now in the operator world, what we do is we back up the resources of the operator as well as any custom resources created 
by the user for the operator. And then we parse uh, any application resources that have been provided or that have been created and we back up the application as well. This is the application that is uh, managed by the operator. And again, as mentioned, when we do back up and restore uh, the operator, uh, it is still an operator based application. So you do not lose your consistency of application tooling that you had originally deployed at wire. Next, I'm going to talk about the overall backup flow. Uh, this is an animated slide, so it should uh, help everyone to understand what is the underlying workflow that we leverage to protect a particular application. So first, what we do is a metadata backup. Uh, so in order to do the metadata backup, the first thing that we do is we spin up a meta mover pod. Uh, what this meta mover pod does is it captures all the metadata information, which is the deployments, the services, the config maps, the secrets, and it moves it into the target location. Then we look at the data backup or we look at the persistent volumes that we need to protect. And as part of the data backup, we spin up the data mover pod. Uh, we spin up one data mover pod for each persistent volume so that we can get parallelism in terms of the speeds and everything that is being moved into the target location. Uh, we take a snapshot of that persistent volume. We convert that snapshot into a new persistent volume, and then we mount it or attach it to the data mover pod so that the data mover pod can read from it uh, does con a convert to a QCOW2 format and stores it on the target location. We detach the persistent volume from the data mover pod and then we delete it. We keep that first snapshot that was originally taken, we still keep that around for incremental backups and to uh, do a uh, compare of the next snapshot that will be taken for the incremental backup. Uh, so now diving into the uh, workflow for incremental backup, uh, what we do is, again, first pod that is spun up is the MetaMover pod. Uh, the MetaMover pod will again capture all the metadata information and put it into the target location. Uh, then we get into the data backup phase. And as part of the data backup, as mentioned, again, we will be spinning up one pod for each persistent volume. Uh, we'll be taking a new snapshot leveraging CSI. Uh, we'll be converting those snapshots to persistent volumes again, attaching them to the data mover pod. We'll do a diff or a compare of these two persistent volumes to get the incremental changes. And then we do a QMU image convert, which is the internal tooling that we use for uh, converting it to that open uh, format, which is QCOW2, and we store it on the target. So then the, uh, basically on the target, it is stored as an overlay image. So as mentioned before, uh, no repeat blocks are copied over. It is only unique blocks that are copied over and they point to the base image or the full image that were, or the full image blocks that were captured as part of the full backup. So it's extremely efficient in terms of uh, uh, how much storage it's occupying and provides a lot of efficiency in that term. Once that is done, we detach and delete the PVs. We delete the oldest snapshot. So in this case, PV snap one will be deleted and we'll keep the snap two around for the next incremental backup. Next, we'll get into the restore uh, procedure. Restore is basically an inverse of how we do the backup operation. So we take uh, the incremental assuming that we are doing a, a restore of one of the incremental backups that we have taken. Uh, we'll first spawn the data mover pod. We will create uh, a CSI volume. We'll do a restore of the PV. We'll attach that PV again to the data mover pod. And then we do a chemo image convert again to the restored PV. Uh, again, the PVs are detached from the data mover pod uh, to complete the data portion of the operation. Next is the metadata restore, where we spin up the meta mover pod for the meta, uh, metadata restore. The application metadata is again restored back into your namespace or uh, particular cluster. 
and then all the application specs and PVs, uh, PVCs are restored to the uh, restored PV. Obviously, everything is done via the CSI interface. So now let's talk about the use cases over here. So based on how Trillia Vault can do its uh, backup and restore, there are a plethora of use cases that are enabled. So basic backup and recovery. You can schedule on-demand jobs. Uh, you can have full and incremental backups. You can uh, restore into a new cluster or into a new namespace into an existing cluster. And uh, you will have full or selective app restore as well. Now, if you are doing disaster recovery, you can use the same technology to take your data and recreate it at another cluster. Uh, again, your clusters can be hosted on-prem. It can be in the cloud. As long as it's a Kubernetes cluster, you will be able to do your disaster recovery. Um, application mobility, you know, from a test dev perspective or from a CI CD perspective, uh, you can back up production environments, recreate it in your dev environments, move it into test, uh, all using Trillio Vault for Kubernetes and enable a smooth CI CD workflow from production to test dev and uh, back and forth. And now, um, as mentioned, today is most, uh, mostly a hybrid uh, world where people have on-prem deployments of uh, um, resources or Kubernetes clusters, and they have uh, public cloud deployments of their Kubernetes clusters and various distributions. So in order to maintain your costs or to avoid vendor lock-in, you can again use Trillio Vault for Kubernetes to take that data from one uh, environment and move it into another environment. And you can maintain a solid TCO and get more for your buck. Next, I'm going to talk about monitoring and logging. So Trillio Vault is uh, integrated completely into Prometheus and Grafana. Uh, what we do is all the metrics from our custom resource definitions, uh, whether they are target uh, backups, uh, backup plans, restores, we send all those metrics. We have defined a few, uh, bunch of metrics and we send them to the Prometheus server. Uh, we uh, do the visualization through Grafana, and uh, what we've done is we are providing almost uh, about 10 dashboards as part of the product, which will be uh, useful to monitor each and every uh, uh, instance of an application or instance of a backup within your Trillio Vault environment. Uh, so we'll, we'll provide about 10 dashboards, but users should be uh, free to create their own dashboards uh, as part of the Agrafana instance as well. Now, from a logging perspective, uh, we are integrating into FluentD. Uh, so all your logs across all your namespaces, uh, wherever you use uh, Trillio Vault for Kubernetes, will be available within FluentD. So you have a single source of uh, truth for all your logging information. And from a monitoring inf uh, monitoring perspective as well, you have Prometheus and Grafana, which would be a single source of truth for your cluster. Now, talking a uh, little bit about the metrics that we expose. So there is uh, informational uh, objects or informational uh, uh, items that we provide around the backup plan, target backups. We have information around the status as to how how much of the backup has completed, the duration of the backup to understand what the transfer speeds were. Uh, you also have uh, how much backup storage is a particular backup using and how much uh, free storage is available on a particular target. Uh, also infos, uh, information about uh, restores, uh, you know, how, how long did the restore take uh, if the restore has completed and Finally, we have health information about our controllers as well. So not only can you manage, monitor your Trillio Vault for Kubernetes application itself, but you can manage and monitor your backups of your other applications within your Kubernetes uh, clusters. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about the security and permissions. Um, so from a, a security perspective, Trillio Vault does not require or does not uh, depend on uh, any admin access or any cluster admin roles or privileges that uh, 
that exists generally within a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we leverage the existing uh, security context constraints that are provided via OpenShift. Um, and from a service account perspective, we provide an additional layer of security by creating our service accounts at runtime or at execution time. Uh, so as a result, those service accounts cannot be used anywhere else. Uh, we have our own set of permissions and capabilities that we define as part of the uh, as part of the product. And all these uh, definitions are provided in our uh, publicly hosted uh, GitBook documentation. Uh, which is at docs.trilio.io. We are also uh, working on building a much more intensive and detailed uh, product definition uh, page, which talks about all the security aspects of the product, you know, in terms of how the application is built, how the application is distributed. Uh, so all, uh, uh, all uh, intricate stuff and useful stuff for our customers will be provided within our user documentation. Okay, next I'm going to move into a quick demo of, uh, of a Helm app on OpenShift. So what I'm going to do here is uh, I have a record demo of uh, how we do a backup and restore of Helm applications on OpenShift. And uh, what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to be showing the PLI or the uh, non UI side of it, and I'll also be showing the OpenShift UI to uh, show how, what the uh, CLI implications were. So, as part of this environment, we are running OpenShift 4.2, we are using Helm version 3, uh, we are using the OpenShift operator uh, for the storage, we are just using a host path CSI driver. And as part of this overall demo, what we are going to be doing is we are going to be deploying just a simple demo app. Uh, we are going to be backing up that app uh, uh, via Trillio World for Kubernetes, and then we'll restore it and make sure that whatever we had backed up is still available and uh, running. So with that, uh, I'm going to start the demo and I'm going to speak over what, whatever is happening over here. So as you see, uh, first, what we're going to be doing is we will be deploying the application, which is a Helm app. And once we have deployed the application, we'll do a Helm list to see that the application has been created properly. We can see the application pods that have been deployed as part of the Helm command. And what we'll do is we'll ensure that the application and the PVCs are all up as part of the deployment. And then finally, we'll ensure that the app is running. It's a simple Hello World app that has been deployed. And now this is the application that we are going to back up and restore using Trillio World for Kubernetes. The first thing to do would be to uh, get the target. Target, as I mentioned, is where we store our backup. And here in this scenario, we have a um, S3 target, which is in uh, Amazon. So next, what we do is we will uh, ensure that the target has been created and is available. Uh, we will define the protection plan, which is the backup plan uh, for the application, which defines or says or uh, uh, says to backup the overall uh, Helm application as defined in the backup plan. Next, what we'll do is we'll go into the OpenShift user interface and just confirm that we have our backup uh, created over there successfully. So in the OpenShift uh, user interface, if you go into Operator Hub and look at the install operators, in our case over here for this demo, we are in the OpenShift marketplace. And you can see Trillio World for Kubernetes has been installed. And now we have the backup plan, uh, which defines the Helm application created. Moving back into the CLI portion, uh, what we'll do is we will trigger a backup of that backup plan or the protection template that we had specified. And next we will do a get backup to see the status of the overall uh, backup operation. You can also get the details of whatever is happening as part of the uh, backup operation. To confirm this on the UI side, 
uh, we go into the backup tab and we see that a backup has been created as per our operation that we executed on the CLI. Going back to the terminal, uh, what we'll do is we'll list the backup, make sure that it is available. Uh, you can see that there is, it is a full backup. Uh, there's start and end time uh, available for the backup as well. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll first ensure that the namespace uh, that we are going to restore this backup into does not have any workload running already. So the restore namespace is empty, as you see. And we will also, uh, so first we'll apply the restore, and then we will do a get on the restore to see that, okay, the restore has started, it is in progress, and the uh, objects are being copied over. We can move over to the OpenShift UI, again, go into the operator, uh, operator instance that was installed in OpenShift Marketplace. And we can look at the restores over here now. And now we can see that a restore has started. It is in the validation step. So basically, we first validate that everything should be able to restore, and then we start the restore. So once uh, the restore is uh, in progress, you can describe the restore object to see what is happening as part of the overall process. And then once the uh, restore has completed, you can do, again, a Helm list to see that your app has been restored successfully. As mentioned earlier, when we do a backup of any application, whether it is a Helm application or an operator-based application, we maintain the uh, deployment tooling consistency. So because it was a Helm application, you can still use Helm list to uh, list the restored app. We can also verify that all the pods have been uh, uh, restored correctly, along with uh, all the other objects like deployments, replica sets, persistent volume, claims, PVs themselves. Um, and then finally, uh, the final test would be to expose the newly restored app uh, via a service and a route. And then we can ensure that the app has successfully been restored into a new namespace. We can confirm everything on the OpenShift UI as well. We can look at the project, the restored namespace project, to ensure that our application is available over there, or all our application objects do exist over there. We see our front-end MySQL app over there, and we should be good to go. Um, so as part of the demo, I also want to kind of uh, move you through a, a quick idea of how we also can be manipulated or managed via the UI. So this is a 4.4 environment that I have in front of me. Uh, we have Trillio World for Kubernetes. We can use the YAMLs within OpenShift to manage or create uh, any custom resource definitions. And we also conform to the dynamic forms that are provided via OpenShift. So if you do not like to use the CLI as much, you can use these dynamic forms, which we have been working closely with uh, Red Hat on uh, to ensure that we can provide the best experience to our end users in terms of a UI. Uh, so basically, this uh, dynamic form is a translation of the YAML that you see over here. So depending upon your choice of interest and your choice of tool, you can switch uh, between one or the other. Um, next, I'm going to talk about compatibility and support. So uh, Trillio Vault, as we mentioned, has been built ground up uh, leveraging the Cube API server, and we integrate directly into uh, you know, the Kubernetes uh, concepts and the uh, overall architecture. So there is nothing new that you need to learn or understand to manage or operate Trillio Vault for Kubernetes. Now, because we are built ground up uh, addressing or aligned with the Kubernetes constructs, uh, you can use us in uh, any upstream Kubernetes environment that supports CSI. Uh, so CSI was uh, supported in uh, upstream, I believe, from 1.12 uh, onwards. And from 1.12 to 1.16, uh, the CSI feature is in uh, alpha stage. 
So what we recommend is uh, for those environments to use Trillio work for Kubernetes for test dev purposes. And then once when CSI uh, did move into uh, uh, beta in 1.17, you can use that for production as well. Uh, from an OpenShift perspective, uh, obviously, uh, 4.1 to 4.3 was when the CSI feature was introduced or 4.1 to 4.3 started using Kubernetes 1.12 and higher. And uh, in those environments, uh, the CSI feature for snapshots is still in uh, alpha. So we recommend to use it for test dev environments and for prod from 4.4 onwards. Uh, from a storage perspective, uh, as I mentioned, we are completely agnostic to the underlying storage. Uh, as long as you use a CSI driver to manage your storage environments. CSI is the de facto uh, protocol that is going to be used moving forward for working with storage via a Kubernetes interface. So we are aligning ourselves also to kind of keep all those pieces agnostic and us, ourselves to be able to move and maneuver with any storage platform. Uh, from a target perspective, uh, in our demo, I showed you that we had an Amazon S3 target, but you could have any S3 compatible storage, which would be hosted on-prem as well. Uh, and also, uh, we support file-based storage, that is via NFS. So if you have an NFS server on-prem or even in your cloud environments, you can use that as your target for storing. Uh, ecosystem tooling, uh, we have, uh, I spoke about our dashboards, which are available via Grafana. We have integrations with uh, Prometheus and FluentD for logging and monitoring. And because we are agnostic and we are built ground up uh, addressing or aligning with Kubernetes, you can run us in any cloud, wherever, uh, wherever you would want to deploy OpenShift, whether it's uh, in GCP, AWS, Azure, IBM, or if you have uh, on-prem managed distributions. Um, as long as it's Kubernetes, Trillio World for Kubernetes will work over there. Okay, so I'm gonna get into the summary, just uh, going over the points that we have discussed today. So first thing is uh, cloud native applications are completely different than traditional applications. There is a lot of uh, independent components that need to be uh, managed and protected along with the metadata and the data. And traditional approaches that we have all been used to uh, before a cloud native world do not satisfy the challenges or the requirements of cloud native world uh, properly. We are Trillio World for Kubernetes as purpose built as an operator to protect cloud native applications. As I mentioned, we can protect your Helm operator or label-based applications. We are Kubernetes native. We fit into the ecosystem via Prometheus, Grafana, Fluentd. Um, we provide cutting edge features in terms of uh, uh, open backup formats, not having the need to do uh, or buy a deduplication appliance for your uh, target storage. Um, along with a lot of security fundamental principles that have been applied within the product. As a result of uh, these features, we enable a plethora of use cases on Trillio Vault uh, for Kubernetes, and I had mentioned uh, backup and restore from a point in time recovery perspective uh, to protect yourselves from threats like ransomware or data corruption in general. Um, you can use it for disaster recovery for moving from one cluster to another. You can use it for CI CD pipelines or for test dev um, application migrations from one cloud environment to another cloud environment uh, from a security perspective or from a cost perspective. Um, and a key point to remember here is that Trillio Vault has been around for a long time. We are the leader in terms of data protection for OpenStack and the app virtualization environments already. So a lot of the uh, copy transfer protocols, the underlying way of how you take data from one environment and move it into another environment has been matured uh, very well over time. Uh, so we are very confident about how we do our technology and we are very uh, proud of how we have built these copy transfer protocols, which provide a lot of savings to the end user. Um, and with that, I would say that I would invite all of you to try out Trillio Vault for Kubernetes today. Um, you can actually log into our website, which is trillio.io. 
you can watch a demo of the product. Uh, you can run a test drive, the same demo that I was showing. You can actually run it in your free, free time directly from the Trillio website without having any infrastructure created for yourself. Um, and then you can download a free trial or a basic edition. So as mentioned, we want to provide developers and IT administrators uh, an equal opportunity to use the product in their own scopes and uh, in their own landscapes. So we have a basic and uh, free edition, uh, the free edition which provides uh, unlimited nodes for 30 days. Uh, and then basic edition, which provides uh, 10 nodes for an unlimited amount of time. Um, and then finally, we have the enterprise license as well, which provides uh, support to all these cutting edge features that our Trader World for Kubernetes provides. So with that, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here and introduce the product. Uh, my email is uh, prashanto.kochavara at trillio.io. My Twitter handle is uh, at kochavara. So if you have any questions, uh, you know, later on or even now, I can uh, take them and answer them for you. Yeah, well, um, Prashanto, thank you. Um, we, I, I knew that I had seen the OpenStack uh, offering that you had, and I had not seen such an in-depth thing around what you were doing with Kubernetes and OpenShift. And so um, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm overwhelmed with like how awesome it is to be, and I, I sound, feel like I'm gushing or something, but it, it, I kept thinking to myself, Man, what didn't you think of? Um, <clears throat> but you answered in the last slide, one of one of the questions that came in from the YouTube was about um, being able to do the workshop on their own. And so, the, you know, I, and sh I encourage everybody to go over to the Trilio um, site and take a take a look at um, their online lab um, there as well. There is one, a couple of questions, um, and one of them is, um, <clears throat> can backups be leveraged with third party tools, for example, can I security scan backups? Correct. So as because we keep our backups in an open format, uh, which is a QCOW2 format, you can leverage them as you want to with the external tools, scanning them, connect the S3 target, and you can uh, do all those intricate uh, post backup operations as well. So because we keep it in an open format, you are able to do all of that. And there was one other question pri prior to that as well, um, which you may have answered, but I'll get that. Um, are there any predefined RTOs for the backup app and RTOs being recovery time objectives? Uh, so you can define, uh, so if you're, we have basic uh, scheduled cron jobs that you can define as per the backup plan. The cron jobs would obviously maintain a RPO uh, not an RTO. RTO would be more based on your, you know, how you in an organization, what is your SLA in terms of getting the application back and up. But uh, from an RTO perspective, that is what we provide through uh, policy scheduling. Hey, Prashanto, Chris Short here. Um, hey, Chris. I, I, I want to, like, thank you and then drive home the importance of staying kubernetes native right like if mm -hmm. you stay in that lane you open yourselves up to all the availability of the entire ecosystem can you talk about the importance of staying cloud native and kubernetes native a little bit to the trilio platform definitely because uh, everything um, the concept of kubernetes is to you know uh, make sure that you are focused on deploying applications and, you know, time to market with applications for customers. That is what uh, Kubernetes is kind of, uh, you know, that's the kind of the idea or the principle behind it. So there are a lot of products which are uh, interfacing with a central API and are leveraging that central API, which is the Kube API server, to build their uh, technology. So if, uh, as a product, you align with that central API that, and, and are Kubernetes, Kubernetes native, then you automatically open yourself to integrate with all these other products as well. If you are not integrated or if you're not Kubernetes native, then what would happen is you would have to have another translation layer to make your product work with another uh, third party ISV or any other vendor product. So as a result, uh, in terms of how we have built our technology, uh, you know, integrations into Prometheus, integration into Fluentd become actually very simple. 
and tomorrow if there are any other ecosystem uh, products that a user would want to integrate uh, into it would uh, it would be very straightforward as well if they are you know just leveraging via the apis and managing both products together so important to utilize that control plane in a consistent manner so yes, kubernetes is staying kubernetes native is so important for folks and i, and I just want to drive that home Definitely. And that's that's one of the reasons, right? You know, uh, traditional approaches, which are kind of VM based approaches, they uh, we need those approaches or that approach needs to change to a cloud native approach so that you can have a complete, you know, just a Kubernetes self-sufficient environment versus having to run, you know, Kubernetes on one side and, you know, virtualization on the other side and stuff like that. Awesome. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Yes. So, uh, well, Mike. My one question to you is, it, it seemed like a very comprehensive um, offering, so I, I almost hesitate to ask, what's on your roadmap? What, what's coming down the pike for uh, Trillio Vault? Because it, like, it's sort of like asking the question, what is missing? But, um, yeah, what are you, what are you working on? Um, so, uh, thank you. Actually, that's a great question for uh, me to kind of educate the users on. Uh, so from a roadmap perspective, we are going to be uh, doing the, so we only have an early access version of the product, which I was showing you within uh, my demo, uh, which is available within Operator Hub and for upstream environments. Now, uh, by the end of this month or early July, we are going to be doing our product. And as part of our, our cadence, our target is to push out code every month. So you want to do it by the first of every month, or at least that's our target of pushing out new features. And we will be doing that you know, cadence uh, from July onwards. Uh, now, from a feature perspective, there are a lot of uh, cutting edge things that we have been thinking about in terms of, you know, providing compression, encryption. Um, and uh, one of the most important things that I would like to talk about is uh, a restore plan. So similar to a backup plan, you know, how you specify what you want to back up uh, as part of your application, we are working on something called as a restore plan. In the restore plan, you can basically specify how you want your application to be laid out after it is restored. Are there certain objects that you want to manipulate before you restore it? Or uh, are there any additional workflows that you want to inject after the restore has been done? So uh, that actually opens up additional use cases and additional opportunities for customers to manage their data and manage their applications in a much more succinct uh, fashion. Uh, so that's uh, one of the cool or important things that we are working on. And uh, the cooler portion of it, uh, at least uh, what I feel, or the more uh, uh, impactful from a customer perspective also, is uh, we will have a separate user interface for Trillio Vault for Kubernetes, so that if you have multiple Trillio Vault for Kubernetes instances running across namespaces or multiple clusters in general, you will have a single source of truth to manage all those TVK instances. Um, so that will give the ability for, you know, doing much more, uh, um, that, will, that will basically make the management of your TVK instances easy and also make you know management of your backup and restore operations uh, easier and that will basically open up uh, future conversations and um, capabilities for us to do you know drag and drop migrations and um, you know things like that i think that sort of also answered but i'll, I'll ask it again um, the question that just popped in the integration into a ama and mcm um, is on the roadmap Yes, yes. So we, uh, as part of our GA, uh, when we do GA, we are going to be uh, Cloud Pack certified. Um, we are going to be Cloud Pack for Data certified, and we, as a stretch goal, we are also targeting uh, MCM uh, certification. And then we would be integrating into MCM to so that uh, through the three layers or the three steps that we have kind of figured out on our end how we will be doing the integration. First will be mostly, uh, you know, uh, uh, basic uh, UI SSO based uh, integration followed up with much more uh, detailed uh, ground level integration between the two products. So I think one of the things that Chris and I were chatting um, separately here is that, that we'd love to have you come back um, in during maybe not during the briefing session, but actually um, do a live coding uh, have 
couple of the developer and evangelist team um, create a cluster, crack it, have it install the backup um, and restore with Trilio, and then um, walk through restoring um, live. Uh, so if you're up for that kind of a challenge, we'd love to have you back um, to do something along that line. Um, yeah, I would love to. That, yeah, I once think that would be really fun. Yeah, once yeah, you're ready to you. GA and show it off, yeah, I'd love to have you back on the live streams okay. here. Yeah, definitely. I think what, what we could probably set up is, um, you know, we can do label based, helm based, operator based backups, show some things, how they are looking in from its Grafana along with logs. I think that should provide a good idea of, you know, how the product uh, flows works and, you know, uh, basically putting the rubber to the road as well. Yeah. No, awesome. That would be awesome because uh, this is, like, I kind of, it, it, it's like magic. It's like you've thought of pretty, pretty much everything. Um, and I, I, I can't wait to, to see it in action live as well. And um, uh, when you get to GA, we'll have you guys back and we'll make sure that this is um, something that we all can um, take advantage of. It's wonderful to see it in Operator Hub and OperatorHub.io already. Um, I really encourage everybody who's listening in, um, whether it's here in the blue jeans or youtube or twitch or facebook um to take a look at this um try out the um the online lab i think that's um pretty cool um to have that um available to so just try it um is, is that catacoda based looks a little yes it is catacoda based that's what it looks like. love those catacoda mm -hmm. um they've they've done lots of great stuff with us and with partners and other commons members but it's wonderful to have you guys as part of the OpenShift Commons um, and in Operator Hub and looking forward to, to the GA date. We'll all celebrate. But in the interim, please do, everybody, um, take it take it for a test drive. And um, we're looking forward to, to seeing how this um, rolls out in the future. So thanks again um, for taking the time, Prashanto, and um, for the other folks from Trilio who um, are online um, answering questions, Justin and Carl. Thanks for, for coming and um, making this happen.